Hello everyone, and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Theory Lectures. So far in this course, we've been reviewing some introductory nuclear physics concepts, and today we're going to discuss the physics of nuclear fission, which, as you can probably guess, is a fairly important reaction for fission reactors. Fission events are initiated when a nucleus absorbs a neutron. The binding energy gained from absorbing this neutron excites the nucleus and provides enough energy to destabilize it. This unstable nucleus assumes this barbell shape as it begins dividing into two halves, and eventually these two halves break apart, releasing some interesting radiation as they do. The neutron that induces fission, which is known as the last neutron, absorbed by the nucleus before fission, contributes the binding energy that destabilizes this nucleus, and thus if a nucleus is to undergo fission after absorbing a neutron, the binding energy, or Q value, gained by absorbing this neutron must be above some threshold excitation energy, which is usually around 6 to 9 MeV. The binding energy gained from absorbing this last neutron isn't always enough to cause fission, and in general there are two classes of nuclei that can fission. Fissile nuclei can fission from the binding energy alone of absorbing this last neutron, while fissionable nuclei require a little more energy to get over this hump. These fissionable nuclei can in fact fission if the instant neutron contributes some significant amount of kinetic energy. This kinetic energy is used to excite the nucleus a little more than the binding energy alone excites it. A most common example of a fissionable nucleus is uranium-238, which cannot fission by absorbing a thermal energy neutron, but can fission by absorbing a fast neutron. This concept of using fast neutrons to fission fissionable nuclei is used extensively by burner reactors, which seek to reduce the amount of actinides present in spent fuel by fissioning them using fast-spectrum neutrons. Before we move on, it's worth answering the question of how we know if a nuclide fissioned. Fission involves forming a compound nucleus, which then takes this barbell shape and then eventually splits up. So how can we tell if a neutron was emitted from fission versus if it was knocked out of the initial nucleus? The answer is time. If the neutron has been emitted by being knocked out or spallated from the target nucleus, then this emission will have no time to form a compound nucleus and is just caused by the kinetic energy from the neutron slamming into the nucleus. A compound nucleus survives for about 10 to the negative 14 seconds before fissioning, whereas it only takes between 10 to the negative 17 and 10 to the negative 22 seconds for a neutron to traverse the nucleus, a factor of 1 millionth or more less time. Believe it or not, we can actually observe this significant time difference in laboratory, which means that we can actually see the time it takes for a compound nucleus to undergo fission. So to summarize, we have discussed how a nucleus needs to absorb enough energy from a neutron to undergo fission. If the energy gained by absorbing this neutron with its kinetic energy isn't at least between 6 to 9 MeV or greater, then the fission cannot occur. However, Fission is a particle physics phenomenon, and we all know the infamous rules of particle physics. The first rule of particle physics is that you don't talk about particle physics. And the second rule of particle physics is that there are no rules to particle physics. Spontaneous fission reactions are one example of the weird black magic that is particle physics. Occasionally, quantum tunneling will allow a nucleus to have enough energy to destabilize and undergo fission meaning that nuclei can fission spontaneously without having received enough activation energy to do so, and actually without having absorbed any neutrons. As with most quantum tunneling phenomenon, the probability of spontaneous fission occurring is very, very low. For example, the half-life for a uranium-238 nuclide that undergoes spontaneous fission is about 6.5 times 10 to the 15th years. This seems like a really, really long time, However, most materials have about 10 to the power of 22 atoms per cubic centimeter, which means that several cubic centimeters of uranium-238 can expect to see a spontaneous fission reaction every few seconds to minutes. Believe it or not, these spontaneous fission reactions have a significant impact on nuclear engineering fields. For example, in nuclear nonproliferation, we seek to detect and prevent the proliferation of nuclear material, which might occur by smuggling some amount of uranium across a country's border. The fact that there are always spontaneous fissions occurring in this material, and that the spontaneous fissions are likely magnified by inducing a fission in other fissile nuclei, 
means that this material produces a source of neutrons that can never be turned off. And we can build detectors and portal monitors to try and detect and observe this unending neutron signal. Getting back to our fission physics, let's discuss the neutrons that are emitted from the fission reaction. The chi distribution, or the chi spectrum, describes the energy spectrum of neutrons that are emitted from fission reactions. Chi of E times DE is the probability that a neutron emitted from a fission event will have some energy within DE of energy E. Because chi is a probability distribution and is thus normalized, we see that the integral of chi of E over all possible neutron emission energies equals 1. The chi spectrum depends on the target nucleus and on the energy of the neutron that induced the fission. In general, higher energy neutrons tend to cause fission reactions that release higher energy daughter neutrons. In general, the chi fission spectrum follows this shape here, where the mean energy of neutron emission is about 2 MeV, and the mode of the distribution occurs around 1 MeV. The chi spectrum is effectively equal to zero at energies below about 100 keV, which means that essentially all fission neutrons are born at fast energies. Next, let's discuss nu bar, which describes how many fission neutrons are released on average per fission event. Just like the chi spectrum, nu bar varies significantly as a function of the fissioning isotope and the energy of the neutron that induces fission. However, nu bar tends to vary much more significantly than chi. This table here, taken from Deuter Stanton Hamilton, shows that nu bar varies significantly depending on whether a fission event was initiated by a thermal or fast energy neutron, and also that nu varies even more significantly as a function of the fissile species. Note that there is no nu bar for uranium-238 for thermal neutrons because uranium-238 requires a fast neutron to fission. In other words, it is fissionable. We can take this new bar parameter and tweak it slightly to get the eta parameter, which describes the average number of fission neutrons released per neutron absorbed. The values of new bar and eta have a significant impact on reactor design. Even relatively small changes in new and eta can leave us with extra or too few neutrons to feed the fission chain reaction. In fact, having some extra free neutrons in a nuclear reactor provides some very interesting possibilities. We can use those neutrons for neutron diffraction imaging, for isotope production, for material science studies, and one other interesting possibility is to use those extra neutrons to produce more fissile isotopes. For example, when uranium-238 captures a neutron, it will produce plutonium-239 after decaying through a few intermediate isotopes. This means that we can use non-fissile uranium-238 to produce fissile plutonium-239 fuel. In fact, Near the end of life for light water reactor fuel, only about 40% of the fission reactions involve uranium-235. The other 60% of fission reactions are fissioning plutonium-239 that has been bred into this fuel. If a reactor's eta value is above 2, then in theory we can use one of the neutrons from each fission event to continue the fission chain reaction, and then we can use the other neutron to create a new fissile isotope to replace the nuclide that just fissioned. By doing this, we can produce as much or even more fissile fuel than we consume in this reactor. This kind of reactor concept is known as a breeder reactor. Natural uranium contains about 0.72% uranium-235, and we have enough easily mineable uranium-235 to satisfy the global energy demand for several hundred years. But with breeder reactors, we can transmute the uranium-238 that makes up the other 99.3% of natural uranium into fissile fuel. This means that breeder reactors can provide humanity with many thousands of years worth of energy from fission, which can probably last humanity long enough for us to start building Dyson spheres around stars or until the multivax supercomputer can figure out how to reverse entropy. We will need to build breeder reactors eventually, but for now they are not essential. We aren't going to run out of uranium-235 for a very long time, so now it's generally not worth building or designing more elaborate and possibly more expensive breeder reactors. For now, the once-through fuel cycle works just fine. However, when we eventually do want to build breeder reactors, we will probably have to build breeder reactors that rely on fissioning either plutonium-239 or uranium-233. As you can see in the new bar table, these two isotopes have higher new bar values than uranium-235, 
and the Uranium-235 new bar values are just slightly too small to enable a 235-based breeder reactor design. The last fission-related metric that I'll discuss today is the capture-to-fission ratio, which is the ratio between the rates of neutron capture and neutron-induced fission in a reactor. The brackets here in the capture-to-fission ratio definition are known as the inner product operators. The inner product of some function simply integrates that function over all of its dependent variables and over all possible bounds. For example, the inner product of f of x, y, and z will integrate our function over all of x, y, and z. Thus, the inner product essentially sums up some quantity over every variable in the entire system. And when applied to these reaction rates, these inner products give us the overall reaction rate integrated over all energies across the entire reactor. The capture to fission ratio is important in reactor design because it describes how effectively nuclei absorb neutrons. A lower capture to fission ratio means that neutrons are more likely to cause fission events versus capture events, and thus are more likely to continue the fission chain reaction. However, a low capture to fission ratio isn't always necessarily a good thing. And in isotope production, our goal is usually to make sure that nuclei absorb neutrons and that they don't fission so that they can transmute into other isotopes. In this case, our goal is to have a high capture to fission ratio. Our reactor's capture to fission ratio is approximately equal to the ratio of its microscopic cross sections. However, this assumes that our reactor contains only one isotope and that our flux has no spatial dependence whatsoever. This is, of course, almost never true. But in general, considering the capture to fission ratio as the isotope's microscopic cross-sections allows us to estimate the worth of fissile isotopes and to estimate how a reactor's capture to fission ratio would change in response to different changes in its neutron spectrum. So now that we've discussed these different fission reaction mechanics, what happens after a nucleus undergoes fission? And what are we left with after a nucleus undergoes fission? Well, first, the nucleus splits into two, but sometimes three or more, smaller nuclei, which are known as the fission products. There are an enormous number of combinations that describe how a nucleus's protons and neutrons can separate into two smaller pieces, and thus the possible atomic masses of fission products follows this double-humped probability distribution, where molybdenum-99 is one of the most common fission products. This distribution is double-humped because a lower mass in one fission product correlates to a higher mass in the second fission product. It's not shown here, but as we increase the energy of the neutron that induces fission, the trough between these two peaks in this distribution becomes less and less deep. As with all of our fission metrics, this distribution of fission products also depends on the fissile species, which means that different nuclei will produce slightly different sets of fission products. In general, nuclei require slightly more neutrons than protons to remain stable which means that when heavy uranium nuclei fission, that their fission products are going to be very, very neutron rich. In fact, more neutron rich than they want to be to remain stable. So to approach stability, these fission products will undergo several rounds of radioactive decay, which is generally alpha or beta minus decay, until they reach a stable Z to A ratio. This gradual series of radioactive decays is responsible for the overwhelming majority of radioactivity in spent nuclear fuel, and most techniques aimed at reducing the reactivity of spent nuclear fuel will try to either separate out or transmute away the longest living and the most significant heat generating of these radioactive fission products. The majority of the energy released by the fission reaction, about 80%, is carried away by the kinetic energy of these fission products. These high-energy fission products have an incredibly short range in materials, which means that most of the energy released from the fission reaction is deposited very close to where the reaction occurs. In contrast, gamma rays and neutrinos that are also released from fission carry about 10% of the energy from fission, and these particles have a much larger range. This longer range means that the particles deposit their energy in different places, sometimes between centimeters and even meters from where the fission occurred. Neutrinos, which are one of the most interesting particles in all of physics, can carry this energy even further. Neutrinos travel at the speed of light, but enigmatically also have a non-zero rest mass and can keep track of time. Most importantly for us, neutrinos have a cross-section that is only very, very slightly above zero, which means that almost every neutrino made in a nuclear reactor 
will stream directly out of the reactor's pressure vessel, out of the reactor's containment, past the power plant's site boundary, and in fact all of the way through the Earth without undergoing any interactions. Thus, all of the energy carried by fission neutrinos essentially disappears and cannot be harnessed at all to produce electricity. Lastly, about 3% of the energy from fission is carried by the kinetic energy of the fission neutrons, which again are born at fast energies as described by the chi spectrum. If you've been keeping track of the math, then you'll notice that we're missing 7% of our fission energy. This final 7% isn't actually released by the fission reaction, but it is instead generated through parasitic neutron capture. Technically, this energy isn't released from the fission process at all, but because the neutron capture rate in a reactor is strongly correlated to the neutron fission rate in the reactor, it's often convenient for our simulation codes to lump the two energy sources together. Overall, each fission reaction releases about 200 MeV of energy, which is about 50 million times as much energy as is released by each coal combustion reaction. This is because nuclear forces are much stronger than atomistic forces, and it speaks to the potential of nuclear power. Because fission generates 50 million times as much energy as a combustion reaction per reaction, a nuclear power plant needs about 50 million times less fuel than a coal plant, and generates about 50 million times less waste than a coal plant. This is what makes nuclear power so energy dense, and what allows for it to be used in long-term scenarios where refueling is impractical or impossible, such as in nuclear submarines, in remote power stations, and for powering deep space missions. This concludes our lecture on the physics of nuclear fission. In the next lecture, we'll dive into the terminology, physics, and kinematics of neutron scattering.